Hi, fellas. Well, it's good to be back here on this Tuesday morning with you all and uh, able to kind of pick up a little bit of where we left off last week. And so something that kind of God put on my heart was to really set some people free of, of guilt. And so there are a lot of Christians out there that even though they might kind of know or, or acknowledge that when they come to the Lord, they confess their sins, he is faithful to forgive, but yet then they continue to walk around in their own self-imprisonment of guilt and, you know, looking back on the things of the past and allowing those to, to keep them from the things of the present and of the future. And so that's why the, the title of this message is Guilt-Free with Bold Confidence to Come to God. And we last week talked about 1 John chapter 3, 18 through 21, which is where I want to begin as we launch into this. But in 1 John chapter 3, it says, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. So we will be confident when we stand before God. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence. And so I think this is just so huge and so important for us to realize, to actually be set free and to actually live guilt-free as Jesus Christ intended, is that he didn't come and die for our sins so that we could then just live uh, an average life wallowing in the things of the past and, and lingering guilt and regret and all these sorts of things, never fully living in God's grace and God's power and God's presence, which unfortunately so many people out there are still living in the, the guilt and condemnation that comes from the enemy, not from, from the Lord. And so this is just a time for us to really reflect. And last week we kind of ended with a question of, you know, what is it or what aspect of your, your life makes you feel like a hypocrite perhaps where is the enemy using something in your life that's that's causing you to feel guilty to lack bold confidence to come to god to lack bold confidence to go and share your faith with others and how do we actually get set free from this and so i wanted to kind of cover a few different things that have been really just you know powerful for me personally and, and I think can really lead people to be set free. And then we're going to have a time of prayer at the end to actually go in and go after this thing for anybody that might still have lingering feelings of, of guilt and regret and remorse from things uh, of old, of your old self, not your new self. And so that's an opportunity that we're going to end with. But I want to start with this difference between false guilt versus true guilt. Because the, you know, God has a particular process, creation, instinctives responses that he's given us and he's hardwired us with but the enemy also can use those very same things and twist them and distort them and create false depictions and lies out of them and so one of the things this guy dan muller says is that uh, you know when people come to him and say well you know god gave me these emotions what am i supposed to do about it he's like no, no no god didn't give you those emotions adam gave you those emotions you can tell the difference between the emotions that god gave you versus the emotions that that Adam gave you by the fruit that they bear. And so we're always judging and evaluating our emotions based upon the fruit that they're bearing in our lives. And if they're not bearing good fruit, then they got to go. They got to they got to be put in their proper place, reevaluated and turned to the truth. And so this this true guilt that we read about in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and this is Paul writing to the Corinthians after he's the he's referring to his to the 1 Corinthians really where he's talking about kind of writing a little bit of a scathing letter of a uh, letter of rebuke to the church. And this is where he kind of comes in and gives us, gives us a depiction of godly grief. And he says uh, in verse 9, he says, Now I'm glad I sent it, talking about kind of the, the rebuking letter from 1 Corinthians, not because it hurts you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. So oftentimes the, the, the guilty feeling is meant to, to actually cause us to repent and turn to the Lord and change our ways. He goes on to say that it was, it was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. So there actually is a level of sorrow that God wants us to have. And that's what we're looking at here. And that kind of level of sorrow goes on to say, so you were not harmed by us in any way. 
For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. So godly sorrow, godly grief, godly guilt, godly conviction, we know it by its fruit because the fruit of that kind of emotion and that kind of feeling leads us in an experience that leads us away from sin and results in salvation. Salvation is freedom. Salvation is eternal life, eternal purpose, life and life abundantly. He goes on to say, there's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, and so this is the difference between the sorrow that comes from God versus the sorrow that comes from the enemy. But worldly sorrow, sorrow that comes from the, from the enemy, it lacks repentance and results in spiritual death. So godly sorrow produces salvation, produces freedom. Worldly sorrow from the enemy produces spiritual death or spiritual complacency or feeling that, that, that freezing up and being locked in. He goes on to say in verse 11, just see what this godly sorrow produced in you. Such earnestness, such concern to clear yourselves, such indignation, such alarm, such longing to see me, such zeal, and such readiness to punish wrong. And so there we get a great depiction of the difference between the kinds of emotions that come from God versus the kind of emotions that come from Adam. And this is a great filter for how we experience our own emotions. Any given emotion is, what is the, what's the fruit coming from this emotion? And is it one that's honoring of God or is it one that's dishonoring of God? And that's the same thing with, with anger. It's the same thing sometimes even with elation or joy. Is that you can have joy for all the godly reasons, but you can also have joy in somebody else's suffering. Which is just, which is being manipulated by the enemy. So this is where we got to really truly understand that, that guilt, true guilt, and sorrow from a godly perspective it's actually uh, you know what social scientists refer to as a pro-social emotion because actually if we were to to harm someone or to say something mean to someone or to do something bad to someone and we never felt get guilt or remorse or regret then we would be able to continually do it over and over and over again and that's what you know you call a psychopath is somebody that can do harm and not feel the least bit bad about it so there's actually those pro-social emotions that are the conviction of God that leads us to repentance and brings us to salvation and reconciliation. It prompts us to actually do that. So the, the, the true guilt from God is a pro-social emotion that drives that kind of behavior. And this is where we get kind of the, the depiction of confessing our sins and, and recognizing God's forgiveness and what that means for the power in our lives. But in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> Praise God. Jeremiah fifteen nineteen. If you repent, I will restore you that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. And then in Psalm 103, 12. It said, God separates our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. Like God's really trying to paint a clear picture of what it means to actually repent and come to God and to come clean with our sins and, and acknowledge those and repent of those before God, ask for forgiveness. And he's letting us know, when you repent and turn to me with those sins, I am faithful to forgive, to restore, to reconcile, to redeem. And yet so few people really truly understand and grasp that truth and receive it in their heart. Because I know there's plenty of people that are asking for forgiveness for the same old thing of the past. Is that they did something 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago that they're still asking. They've asked God, you know, a thousand times for forgiveness over it. But God says, I'm faithful to forgive you the first time you ask. And so... This actually then kind of comes down to Romans 8, 1 through 2. It says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. <laughs> like talk about like wiping the slate clean. That you are washed as white as snow. That you are now the righteousness of God. 
This stuff is so mind-blowing that it's, it's so hard for people to really wrap their mind around, truly accept, and believe for themselves. In Romans 4, 7 through 8, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those who record the Lord, uh, for, for whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. So it's this idea that once our sin has been repented of, it should result in a rejoicing of God. So if you've repented and asked for forgiveness of your sin, yet you're still living in all this guilt and condemnation and regret afterwards, then you've missed it because now you should be on the side of rejoicing. And so if it's not leading to salvation and it's not leading to rejoicing, then you're still living in the things of the past. And so a really powerful, powerful story that I heard several years back, and I'm going to kind of read it from, this is actually in uh, my second book, Untapped Potential, but it came from this, this professor, uh, Mary Poplin, who's a professor out at the Claremont Colleges. And she was a woman who really kind of uh, went on a kind of wild spiritual seeking experience throughout her college years and well beyond. She was, really didn't accept Christ until she was in her 40s. And she had been, you know, as a radical feminist professor at the Claremont Colleges for, for many years. And, and when she finally encountered God in a really powerful, transformative way that completely renewed her mind, set her free, and sent her on this com- ridiculously different journey and life trajectory. But she was saying how when she was prior to being a Christian, she had had multiple abortions. And she really didn't feel any sort of guilt or or condemnation about them until she became a believer in Christ. And then the spirit of God that was in her began to convict her of those abortions. And so she began to repent and go to God for forgiveness and repent and go to God for forgiveness and and repent and go to God with forgiveness. And then one day she, she found herself at this uh, it's the spiritual retreat. And in this, the, the leader was talking about and trying to lead them into forgiveness and into a time of forgiveness. And so during the break, he had instructed them to, you know, get alone with God and really go to God with, with who you need to forgive. Who are you yet to forgive that you need to really release and, and let go of? And so she did that. She got alone with God. And, and I'll kind of read uh, some of what she said here. But she said, Um, that while she was walking uh, with her card to write down, she heard a stern male voice say, who are you not to forgive someone I have forgiven? She heard God say this three distinct times. She was confused. Dr. Poplin dropped to her knees and pleaded, Lord, I don't know what you're talking about. The response came back. I forgave you the first time you asked, and I don't want you to ask again. That's when she realized that God was speaking to her about the issues of her abortions. And she continued on. She said, a lot of people say to me, God was telling you that you need to forgive yourself. He actually wasn't telling me to forgive myself. He was telling me, you don't even have the authority to do that. She says, self-forgiveness is something contrived out of secular psychology. Scripture never asks someone to forgive themselves. In fact, I spent a year reading the Bible looking for any reference to God asking someone to forgive themselves. I couldn't find anything. We, asked, we are asked to forgive others who trespass against us, and we are asked to go to God for forgiveness, but we were never asked to forgive ourselves. Before receiving this revelation, Scripture had assured me that I was forgiven, yet I was still working it off until I felt that I might deserve it. And I'm sure there's some people in here that can resonate with that. That she was still trying to work it off until she felt that she might deserve the forgiveness. But trying to work it off, I would only feel free one moment and not the next. And so it was this this deep realization that it wasn't God, basically God was saying, like, who are you to hold your authority over mine? So the idea of saying to her, who are you to not to to not forgive someone that I have forgiven. That means when we are still walking, even though we have repented, God is telling her, just like he would all of us, stop asking. I forgave you the first time I asked. I cast it as far as the east is from the west. That he says that it actually casts it into the sea of forgetfulness. Yet we're the ones conjuring it back up, going on a submarine expedition to, to pull it back out of the sea of forgetfulness. 
and bring it back to, to life, bring it back to our experience, bring it back to God. And God keeps trying to throw it into the sea of forgetfulness and you strap on the scuba gear and dive back in and go get it. Like that's literally what's happening every time we do that. And the enemy is trying to trick us into doing that by feeding us those thoughts and we indulge it and go after it and go pry it back up. And so that's that idea of saying, like, I forgave you the first time you asked. Like, stop asking. The fact that, I, he, that God forgave you but yet you're still walking in guilt and condemnation and regret means that you're trying to hold your authority over his. And you're not surrendering at all. There's that beautiful song of like, I surrender all. That means all of it. Surrender not just your, your sins, not just your life, but also surrender your guilt, your regret, your condemnation. You get to surrender all of that. That's the beautiful thing about Jesus is that he didn't just say like surrender your joy. He's also saying surrender your sorrow. Not just surrender your happiness, but surrender your, your regret. Don't just surrender your freedom to me, but surrender the slavery to me. It, it's all of this kind of deep, powerful transformation that God has laid out for us in Scripture, but yet we continue to walk in all these old things and completely miss it. And maybe even be led astray by other well-intentioned Christians that have never really truly accepted God's forgiveness themselves. They're still walking in that, and they lead us down that path as well. And so this is the time to really get free. And I love what uh, one of our pastors said this weekend. He said, God treated Jesus as if he lived my life. And now God treats me as if I lived Jesus's life. Like that's a pretty powerful thing to wrap your mind around. The fact that, that God treated Jesus as if he lived your life. And he treats you as if you lived his. It is crazy powerful that that's the thing that'll set you free. That's the thing that'll now put you on the path of like, now, now knowing that, that God treats me as if I live Jesus's life, gives me all the inspiration I need to actually live Jesus's life. Because I wasn't living it before. He paid the penalty. He washed that white of snow. He made me a new creation. He cast the old self into the sea of forgetfulness. I'm not gonna go back and dig it all up. I'm going to actually rejoice because I believe that I'm forgiven. And I'm going to walk in that truth and I'm not going to be tempted and baited and brought back into all that regret and, and, and remorse and then live a life of wallowing in, in, in self-regret and all these sorts of things, but actually live free because that's the price that he paid. And anything short of us living in freedom is living in short of what God paid for. And so there's so many people that would go on to a car lot and even though God paid for the, the fanciest, nicest Tesla you could, you could possibly walk out of there with, people are willingly going onto the car lot and then driving off in a 1988 used Toyota Corolla. When God paid for the brand new 2023 Tesla. Like that's what we're doing when we still continue to, to live the life of the old and say, I'm not deserving of that. I'm not deserving of the highest prize. I'm not deserving of the highest price that was paid. I'm not deserving of that level of freedom, of that level of power, of that level of authority, of that level of, uh, of living. And so I'm going to continue to do this thing over here, which is completely got, uh, you know, dishonoring to God. He's like, I paid for this. Anything short of living of this is dishonoring of the price that God paid. It is dishonoring to the life that Jesus lived and the death that, that, he, that he took upon himself. And so this is just huge to understand the difference of the false guilt because the, the false guilt really gets into when, when you experience false guilt, it's to be innocent of something yet feel guilty about it. So false guilt is when you're actually innocent of something yet you feel guilty about it. And the power of innocence is that they've got the definition there of innocent means not guilty of a crime. It means you're guilt free. You're in the clear. Beyond criticism, you're now honorable, you're upright, you're squeaky clean in Jesus Christ. So that's like, that's the reality of scripture, what it says about us, that those that repent and turn to God and confess their sins, that he's faithful to forgive, to restore, to redeem. And now we are innocent because when he sees us, he sees Christ. And so that's what, he, that's what God has given now in this new creation, this new identity, and anything short of that, living in false guilt, is just going to hold us back. 
because false guilt results in depression and spiritual paralysis. It's completely me-centered instead of God-centered. So where our, our, our self confined, it's almost this, this self-imprisonment of guilt and regret of the old, that's a me-centered approach to God rather than a God-centered or a Christ-centered approach to the Father. And so we're placing, again, our life and our authority over Christ's life and Christ's authority when we're still walking and feeling and, and wallowing and all of that. And on the back side, this is, you know, we're just, when we do that, we're playing into to Satan's dangerous trap. We're playing right into Satan's hand. Because as uh, Todd White's described, he talks about rear view Christianity. When people come to Christ, but yet they're still looking, instead of looking ahead as new creation and looking at, the, at what God has done for them and what he's bringing them into, they're constantly looking back at what they did in the past. And they, they're living this lifestyle of rear view Christianity. And so that's the, the trick of the enemy. And so I included down here a few of the list of the names of, of Satan and how that plays a factor in us continuing to live in guilt and condemnation and shame rather than in freedom. And so the first one is the roaring lion, is to be aware of the fact that in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, be sober-minded, be watchful. And when we think of sober-minded, you know, we kind of typically address that and connect that with, with drunkenness. You know, we know that when we're drunk, we're out of our, we're, we're kind of out of our normal uh, thinking, that we lose our faculties of our mind, we lose focus, we lose that watchfulness. But it's not just drunkenness. We can also uh, be drunk on emotions. So to be sober-minded, not just including drugs and alcohol, but it also includes your emotions, your thoughts, your feelings that are clouding your judgment. So when we think of, of being drunk, literally in the, the alcoholic sense, it's this idea of, of losing control, of being misguided, of a lot easily being deceived. And it's the same way that our emotions can do that to us as well. And so even though there's plenty of people that don't have an issue with alcohol, they got tons of issues with emotions. And they are not allowing themselves to be sober-minded when it comes to their emotions and being watchful. For your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour so we have to know that the enemy's coming back for us the enemy doesn't doesn't like your freedom he doesn't like your identity as a son of god he doesn't like your your ability to become a new creation the 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 enemy and uh, the fallen angels were actually super pissed that god gave us the the kind of stature that he did as sons and daughters of god only slightly lower than the angels and that really upset the enemy, that, we, that he would look at us and see us as such higher elevation than we would naturally look around and see ourselves. And so he's looking for someone to devour, meaning that one who looks for prey. And he becomes this predator trying to drag us back and bring us back in. And then the, the father of lies, that in John 8, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. He's a liar. So he uses lies. He uses deception. He uses manipulation to bring us back into old regret, old remorse, old shame and condemnation. And he uses the lies to do that. That's why we have to be in our word, familiar with the truth, clinging to him. There's so much scripture, in, especially in the New Testament, that talks about you got to cling to the truth. You have to remain steadfast. You have to fight the good fight. Why? Because there's an enemy who's like a roaring lion going around looking for someone to devour. And the easiest people to devour are the ones that don't know the word of God, that don't have the truth in their heart and in their mind, the ones that don't have the ability to recognize a lie from the truth in their own mind. They don't have the ability to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. And because of that, they're so easy to devour, whether it be through drugs or alcohol or emotions or other things. But he uses the lies and the distortion to do that. Number three is the tempter. Is it in Matthew chapter four, one through three? It says, then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So he, the enemy is a tempter. The person who presents a challenge before someone to dis disobey God. So that's where he's constantly presenting these challenges. He's tempting us to go back, to put on the scuba gear and go back to the sea of forgetfulness. 
That's what he's tempting you to do. And he knows you're very likely to do it because the truth is actually too powerful and too amazing that you feel undeserving. And in your undeserving feelings, you put on the scuba gear and you go back to the sea of forgetfulness and you dig, you bring all that stuff back up onto the shore. And that's the, the temptation that's at hand. And then he's also the accuser says in revelations twelve ten, i heard a voice a loud voice in heaven saying now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of god and the authority of his christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before god so the accuser here satan is one who presents someone's violations of the law before a judge the one who presents someone's sin to God. So he's accusing us. So get a picture of, of this is that, first of all, he goes around lying, distorting, deceiving, and tempting us to sin. Right? So he goes around lying, distorting, tempting us into sin. Then we fall for that trick and we fall into sin. And then he says, gotcha, and now takes that sin and goes and accuses us to God. Like, it's brilliant. It's ridiculous. And we play right into his hand. He tempts us and leads us into sin, and then immediately turns on us. And then accuses us before God. I mean, it's just crazy. And then number five is the murderer. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. It's John eight forty four. So the killer, he's trying to end our lives. He's trying to bring us into spiritual death. That's the worldly sorrow brings a spiritual death. And the ultimate spiritual death of us being eternally separated from God, not because he actually wants us and cares about us, is just so spiteful to God that he's doing it out of pure jealousy, envy, rage, and anger that he wants us on his side. Not because he cares the least bit about us, but because he knows how much it's going to it's going to pain the father that's why he drags us out that's why he leads us astray that's why he's trying to bring us into the pit of hell and it's so opposite than anything else is that usually you know so much of the time we're used to and that's the, the exact opposite of god he's leading us towards him he's leading us towards heaven because he so loved us because he calls us sons and daughters because he loves us and has compassion upon us and he wants fellowship and he wants intimacy and he wants connection and he wants rootedness. That's why God is calling us towards heaven. The enemy is simply calling us to hell, not because he loves us or cares about us or really wants us. He's doing it all in total spite of God the Father just to create pain and anguish for God and pain and anguish for us. That's it. And yet we fall, though that's the person's hand that we're playing into with all of this and then the last one Bill uh, Belial that 2nd Corinthians six fifteen. what accord has Christ with actually is there a pastor that knows how to pronounce that you may know how to pronounce that word Belial there we go was it yeah Belial so or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever and that word actually translated means worthless so it means the spirit of evil personified, lacking worth and worthless. And so here's the thing about Satan is that he knows he's worthless at the end of the day. He knows he's completely worthless. But it's that whole idea of those that, um, mis it's the idea that misery loves company. Worthlessness loves company. So he knows that he's worthless. Because at the end of the day, if there was a true battle between God and sometimes we kind of like, we think of good and evil, and we almost put it on a level playing field of thinking that Satan is as much evil power as God has good power. And that's just not, that couldn't be further from the truth. Is that really at the end of the day, the, a true battle between God and Satan would be like a, a little ant here, and it would be like that. Just flicked off of the podium, flicked off of the stand. Like there's no equal playing field whatsoever. He's completely worthless in comparison to God. And that's where he's distorting and manipulating us because he wants our identity locked in worthlessness. There's so many, even Christians, that view themselves as unworthy and worthless when it comes to the kingdom of God. And because of that, it 
it, it inhibits their ability to truly receive truth and identity as a son of God, truly forgiven, wiped clean, set free, restored, a new creation, fully born again. They can't even wrap their minds around it because the enemy has convinced them that they're worthless. When in reality, the exact opposite is true, is that we are made in the image of God, which is the ultimate endless value. I mean, you can't even put a price tag on it. That's how valuable God is, the value of the blood of Christ. And he said we're made in his image. That we now, as we come to him and are restored to him and his righteousness, we now share the inheritance of heaven and have that level of value upon us. And yet, so many of us are still walking in the worthlessness, in the lies, in the deception, still putting on the scuba gear, still going back to the sea of forgetfulness, bringing all that back up, and doing so because of the temptation of the enemy and because of our own unwillingness to receive the truth for ourselves. Because we say, I see how this could be true for others, but I know me. I know my thoughts. I know my deeds. I know my past actions. I know my lack of and my shortcomings. And God's saying, and that's where we said yesterday, is that so much of our mindset, our thinking, and our behaviors is trying to play catch up to what Christ has already accomplished in our lives. Christ already set us free, made us a new creation, gave us the, the full value of God in our hearts and in our lives, completely washed us white as snow, and set us free. But our mindset needs to be renewed, and it needs to catch up with what Christ has already done. 